In this video, we'll look at the trace determinant plane graph itself, how it's constructed, and how we can use it to interpret what's going on with these different constant coefficient systems. So remember, we're doing this plane again. We have our two axes. Our vertical axis here is D. Horizontal axis is T, the trace. Now we're going to draw the important curve out here that defines the discriminant of that situation, which is the parabola D equals T squared over 4. So based on our previous work, we know that if t squared minus 4d is negative, that means we are complex. And now based on our setup, if t squared minus 4d is negative, that is above this graph. Because if d is too big, then t squared minus 4d will be negative. And so above here, this is sort of where we get all of our complex stuff. And outside is the real stuff. So what can we write on here first? Well, if you look at the real case, so we're below this parabola now. If D is negative, I get a saddle. Now D negative means everything below the T X here or the X axis on this graph. So everything down here is saddles. You can sort of draw a mini saddle here if you want to, to illustrate what's going on. Now above the T axis, we have two options, the left side or the right side. On the left side, we have trace negative. If the trace is negative, that means I have a nodal sink. So over here, we have nodal sink. Over here, we have nodal sources. I'll put a little, little picture in here again to illustrate what's going on, but that's what's happening here. So nodal sink, everything flows in. Nodal source, everything flows away. Now, jumping inside the parabola going above it, we again have three options. If the trace is negative, zero, or positive. If the trace is negative, again, that's the real part, that's a spiral sink. If the trace is positive, I get a spiral source. And if it's zero, so if we're on that axis, I get a center. Again, I'm gonna add in little pictures for those three. And the last thing we have left is repeated roots, which are gonna be when the discriminant is zero or when t squared minus four d equals zero or when d equals t squared over four, i.e. on this parabola. If we're on the parabola and the trace is positive, in the case of repeated roots, the discriminant part is zero. And so the eigenvalue is just t over two. So if t is positive, we're going to get a repeated with a positive eigenvalue or an improper nodal source. And if it's negative, we get improper nodal sink. So on the positive side, this is our improper nodal source. And over here, we get the same but a sink. And again, a couple pictures to illustrate that. So here's our completely filled in picture of this trace determinant plane. It basically shows how all of these different types of solutions interact with each other. Now, the main things I want to emphasize here are the lines of this graph. The idea of where these boundaries are and how you cross over them is going to be important in seeing what's going to happen for nonlinear systems coming up in a little bit. We'll get there eventually, but the idea here is that for a nonlinear system, it behaves similarly to a linear system. And by that, I mean that the eigenvalues are close to some corresponding linear system. To summarize this, so we're nonlinear which we have not defined yet, it behaves like the eigenvalues are close. And so things that are on boundaries don't really like when you're close because being on that boundary means you have to specify a certain condition to keep that behavior. So things on boundaries can be problematic here. The other point to emphasize is how these things all come together. So the main thing I want to emphasize with this is the connection between the improper nodal sinks and then the spirals and nodal versions of them. If you look here at a nodal sink that we have over here and our spiral sink, what sits right between them? Well, that's our improper nodal sink on this boundary. So the improper sort of sits as a barrier or a boundary between the nodal sink and the spiral sink. And the improper nodal sink kind of has a behavior as well that sits between them. The solution curves try to spiral but they can't because they run into a straight line solution. And you sit between spirals and things that have straight line solutions. And so because of this, right, you sort of almost see a spiral in the improper nodal sink, but not quite, where you see the full spiral here and no spirals in, in the nodal case. The same thing happens in the source side where you have your improper nodal source, that sort of sits as the boundary between your nodal source with no spirals and your spiral source with no straight lines. So the behavior is kind of like a hybrid of a nodal source and a spiral source when you have an improper nodal source. So it sits right between them and has sort of a little bit of both in how it's drawn. So I'll notate that here as improper nodes sit between nodal 
and spiral versions. And then the other boundary to keep in mind here is the one between spiral sinks and spiral sources, which are centers. This also kind of makes sense because if you take a spiral sink and you start decaying slower and slower and slower, you're gonna look more and more like a center until you stop decaying. When you stop decaying, you become a center and then you start expanding and that's spiral source. So the center here is sort of a boundary again between spiral sinks and spiral sources. Now, you might think about this boundary here as well, but what is that boundary? Well, that boundary is d equals zero. For d equals zero, if our determinant is zero, that means we have zero as an eigenvalue. And if zero is an eigenvalue, the matrix is not invertible. And in that case, we're not really considering what happens there. You can get some kind of strange behaviors if you have a zero eigenvalue for your matrix. We're going to ignore that fact. There's nothing really useful or exciting about it. It just does kind of weird things sometimes. So there is your trace determinant plane, the picture that sort of connects everything from homogeneous constant coefficient linear systems and the types of phase ports you can see among them. A nice summary to fill out and sort of get practice with what these things look like. But it's also going to be really useful when we start talking about nonlinear systems and seeing where we really only care about the behavior of the system, not the actual eigenvalues. This can be a nice way to visualize what's actually happening to that nonlinear system or the corresponding linear version, which we'll get to when we get to nonlinear systems in general.